Hi, I'm Dubba, I'm Director of Music Tech Fest, and this is the MTF Podcast. Today's episode is a really special one for me. At MTF Stockholm back in September, I had the chance to sit down and talk with, literally, my favourite musician on the planet. There's something incredibly special about what Jan Bang does that completely stands him apart, and it just really speaks to me. It uses technology in an incredibly organic way, it's improvisational, collaborative, and it provides a context within which his fellow musicians can absolutely shine. Jan runs the unique Punkt Festival in Kristiansand in Norway. He's worked with some legendary artists, and he also happens to be a genuinely lovely human being, and you'll find that out when you listen to this interview. It was an absolute honor to have him at Music Tech Fest performing, experimenting, and contributing. Really pleased to introduce the remarkable Jan Bang. Thank you, thank you. You play other musicians, is what <laughs> you do. Right. I'm a thief. Um, I, um, in the mid '90s, I um, found by coincidence a way of putting my studio gear on stage. Being a producer in the m- in the mid '90s, using samplers in order to you know to create songs and do remixes and productions and and so forth. Um, I was invited by a friend of mine. I just had done a remix of Bugge Wesseltoft, the Norwegian jazz player. And he was interested in, in uh, getting in touch with people from the electronic music. So he asked me, Jan, what could you do? <laughs> I was thinking, well, I have this uh, sampler that somebody gave me. Why don't I, instead of sampling records, I could sample your musicians on stage? And that was in 96. And um, we did one concert, and I, I, I realized in the sound check that this is just a new route. This is a new possibility for for myself to discover new things. So it's like fresh sounds every day, like fresh from the baker. Uh, and as a, as a composer and as a, as a musician, that's uh, quite a present. So then I, you know, by meeting uh, him, then he introduced me to other more free form players. And uh, from there, I, <laughs> I never really returned to the studio that I was working with. And not working in as a producer. I just left the studio, my big American case and <laughs> everything with it. And you describe yourself as a live sampler, yeah. I guess. That was the, the term that, that we uh, decided to call it, begin myself. What should we call it? Let's call it live sampling. And it's sort of taken a life on its own. And, and uh, it's just a technique. Um, so it could... Like with punk, I'm, that we're probably going to talk about later, but it, things like that could easily become just like gimmicks. So you have to fill it with content um, because it's it's an empty source. So depending on who you play with and shit in, shit out. <laughs> uh, and of course, myself also into that I- equation. Well, you work with remarkable musicians. I mean, it, like, it's not just that you play with good musicians. You, you play with remarkable musicians. But what you do kind of transforms what they do. And, and actually, it provides a context for them. You're like, I, I imagine what you do as being like, uh, if you think of a painting, there's the figure and the ground, and you're the ground. Uh, and you provide the color and the space for them to be what they are but without that it wouldn't it wouldn't have the same thing but i mean name drop i mean you work with Brian Eno, you've worked with david sylvian you've worked with you know uh uh Sitzel and Dressen and you know sort of remarkable musicians um but you what you do kind of contextualizes them is that is that kind of how you think of it because that's how i interpret yeah. it yeah um um my only concern are uh, is the the um, the result um i'm interested in in processes more and more processes than um commercial or financial success so i'm uh, I, and i want to challenge myself to work with people that could challenge me and and how i work but mostly it's to make other people shine that's really my work <laughs> you know in order to 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 give them enough resistance as a producer either on record or in a live situation to uh, to make something that i kind of 
is a vague um, idea of where I'm going. Mm. Um, that's a kind of a vague answer, isn't it? <laughs> well, okay, so let's get a little bit more specific then. How would you describe your music to somebody who hasn't heard it? Um, you mentioned some of, of that that has to do with uh, the perspective. So, so um, that could either be with, uh, you know, I've been working closely with Arva Henriksen. That's probably the closest... Um, uh, ECM musician and Rune Gamofun and that type of labels, um, and work closely with him in order for uh, for um, for him to shine. It's important for me to to not necessarily do uh, collaborations where my name is on the front cover, mm. but to work as a producer and as a composer. And I see that um, that um, that. With that, that uh, just to follow my own instincts, that could <laughs> actually keep me working for, for a longer period of time, as opposed to, you know, doing a, uh, being fo focused on doing a solo career. Mm. And I, I also enjoy that collaboration thing. Mm. I think that music is a, is a collaborative effort, um, and it's a social thing. And especially when it comes to, to electronic music, which can be like a painting, you know, like a painter that works in solitude, works alone. Mm. Um, I do enjoy that social uh, aspect of it. To be clear, you do have solo records. Though. I do. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that, because uh, if you take the other musicians out of the equation and there is just your name on the front of the record sleeve, what's the difference in approach for you? Well, it's much, much of the same, but I, I noticed that my, my working methods has changed over the years. So uh, I used to spend maybe three years working on an, on an album, uh, and now I, I've tried to take that down and to maybe use like two years, one year, six months, three months, two months, one month, two days with the same artist so that... Um, so it's possible. Is it possible to use all your knowledge and your creativity into focus into a short period of two days? Yes, it is. Mm. <laughs> That's what I found out. Right. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you will. It will be a better result if you work on a piece for you know that amount amount of time. Well, it helps that you're an improvising musician as well as a composer, yep. necessarily. I, I guess if you've got two days and you're a composer and not an improvising musician, mm. that's, that would be quite a different thing. Mm, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Um, talk about your work with Arva Henriksen, for instance, and, and when I was thinking about this, who's my favorite musician in the world, there was a little bit of a battle there. Arva Henriksen is my favorite trumpet player yeah. in the world. And the one thing that you two seem to share, and again, this is my subjective interpretation of what I hear when I listen to your records, is that there is a real focus on breath and breathing in how you, even when I see you on stage, how you move is about breath and it's about that rhythm. And I, I don't know if that's how you think of it, but that's how I experience it. Yes, it's, I, it's, yeah, it's I agree. I just read a blog by a friend of mine, J.A. Dean, Dino, um, who I used to work with when I worked with John Hassel. Um, he's talking about that electronic mus music or electronic instruments doesn't, does not breathe. So how could you as an electronic musician uh, work on that breathing? And he's, he says, well, you could, for instance, turn off the uh, quant quantize function. <laughs> you know, do you have to set a tempo in order for it to, to, uh, uh, to, to in order to, to make this, this track? I've also learned quite a lot by working closely with Manfred Eicher of ECM and the way that he is actually bringing a lot to the table and a lot of air, you know, a lot of, of, of uh, openness mm. and not necessarily to, to fill every space with information because we have so much of that. So, uh, and through this work with Sylvian, maybe to leave some space for the listener so that it's possible for you or me as a listener to, to have some of myself in that, mm. you know? You were mentioning also the importance of, of um, having some kind of uh, art or music that makes you look inwards as opposed to only uh, outwards. Mm. 
uh, this has been important for me since I was 14, you know, that way of, although I, I do like good R&B. Yeah. <laughs> the, the focus on the breath and, and other contexts uh, takes you very quickly towards meditation, and, and quite often your music is described as meditative music, uh, although there are surprises in it quite regularly as well. Is, is there a kind of a spirituality behind that? Not at all. No. Um, at least not any sort of religious uh, thing, but I mean, we're all spiritual human beings just by <laughs> floating in space. Um, but um, for me, it's, uh, it's important. I mean, I have a dual relationship with ambient music because um, it can be, um, it can be become this uh, just dull thing that you, know, you just fill every gap. And, and then there's no perspective. So I, for me, it's important to, to always uh, rethink what is, um, is this element uh, still value? You know, like, a, you know, if you follow the, the, the distorted guitar, at what point did it stop being a provocative thing mm. that represented danger? And what represents that today? Is that a feedback, you know, high frequency feedback? Um, where you think, will this hurt me? Is this damage? Will this damage my ears? Uh, I'm interested in those kind of phenomena. And the symbolism of what these sounds represent is that is that something that you kind of go and as a composer you say, I want to communicate these things, or is it just these noises are how I feel right now? <laughs> Maybe it's just uh, like um, if if you first dive into those type of things, it just generates kind of itself. Uh, but also I think that it's important, and I do value that, the, the conversations I have with uh, fellow musicians. Mm. So when we are traveling together, performing in different places or, or doing recordings, that we always have these conversations about, you know, um, what is interesting, I, or, you know, uh, what are the possibilities, and uh, what about doing something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's important, and that's also the social... Um, benefits, I think, of of, of music that c can be a social activity. I do believe in that. Let's talk about punk for a minute. Yeah. Um, you have the look about you of a man who's uh, finished his festival recently, <laughs> yes. rather than one who's in the middle of yeah. it right now. <laughs> um, I know how you feel. Yeah, absolutely. But punk is a, is a fascinating festival, and I, I've always wanted to go to it, and a couple of years ago I got the chance to do that, and it was pretty much exactly what I thought it was going to be, which was mind-blowing. And it's, it's unique in the sense that you have a performance and then you have a remix of that performance. Yeah. And then you have another performance and then a remix of that. Yeah. I, I, I know, I mean, where did that idea come from is a, is a ridiculous question because it's obvious where that idea came from. Yeah. But, but um, what convinced you that that was a format for a festival? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> the first year we did it, uh, there was 20 people on the first row in a big theater, you know, 400 capacity. So it was kind of embarrassing, for at least for the guy who put his money into it. But, um, but we thought that we had a good idea. Uh, and uh, it, it could easily have just been a kind of a gimmick kind of thing, you know. We have the new tools. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Um, so... Um, but, but um, if you have a good idea and you believe in that idea, just stick to it, and then um, th then it might you know gain interest in other people. So the basic idea for punct is is just like a, a bigger version of that live sampling technique that I just explained, um, where um, instead of sampling other musicians on stage, we sample entire concerts. Um, so we have a, a band playing, or an orchestra playing, or a solo performance, and then somewhere behind there are people sampling out bits and pieces, um, working closely with, with both acoustic and electric players. Uh, and then immediately after the performance, they go and do their performance. So it's, a, it's, it's a live remix uh, of, of that, so a, a kind of a deconstruction of what just happened. So that's a starting point. You know, you, you have somebody else's you know, music as a starting point for your own work. 
and uh, and the whole idea is to was to push push us into new ways of creating music. It's always that um, that element of of creating new music. Because in the context of most conversations about music sampling, of course, it leads you directly to copyright. Yes. And what you found is a way to actually engage these as musical instruments in the, in the process of co-creation rather than the process of remix, remash, remodel, resample, yeah. and, and, and like make, it's not making new music out of old music, it's making new music with other musicians right. using their own sounds. Yeah. Um, but in the slightly kind of uh, offset world of punked, you are making a performance out of somebody else's performance, which is a really interesting kind of middle ground, I think. It is, and, and it comes down to, I mean, things you, also, you have been discussing at Music Tech Fest. Um, I think it comes down to trust, so that we do all our booking, not in the yellow pages, but we, we meet people, we see if we have something in common, and then we invite. And since it's a music, um, a musician-driven festival, then uh, there is a trust involved in it, um, uh, and that's that's the the crucial thing for it. So that if we invite someone like like Ruchi Sakamoto to to do a concert, he would know that he's in in fairly good hands. <laughs> 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 that uh, it's treated with respect and uh, and it moves the music forward. But that like-mindedness isn't uh, that you all sound the same or that there is a genre even kind of... Uh, I mean, I, I heard a wide diversity of bands the, yeah. that I was there. Mm. Um, what Are there musical parameters? We have tried different things. We've tried uh, um, having people prepare for the, for the remix. Guy Sixworth did a... A remix of uh, Susanne Sundfer, a Norwegian uh, artist, which were ve very well prepared, and to me, that's uh, w one way of doing it. But 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 it's not not something I would have done myself. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in the blank hard disk, uh, so you you only fill it with whatever is happening in the room. It makes your you know the blood in your body run a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. So so. Uh, um, and also, to the, I think that the, the mixture of the electronics, acoustics, and um, uh, and, uh, and electrical instruments—that's uh, the beauty and the beast. Right. And of course, the electronic being the beauty in, in this context. <laughs> so, just just for clarity, when you walk onto a stage with a band about to perform, you have no sounds. That's right. In your sampler, no. What you do is the first note you hear you take and you interpret. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but, but we know this when we create music in the studio. We, we, this is how we compose, isn't it? That's how we make records, that we, we have one sound and then we have another one. And then we see the, the, the combinations or unusual combinations. So based on who, how you do your programming, who is playing on the main stage and who is actually doing the remix, you can create these uh, very exciting uh, meetings, you know, between contemporary, uh, uh, like modern composition and and uh, very, very sort of minimal techno or or whatever mm. improvises. So. so that you know, and I, uh, I I was kind of reluctant to tell you this, but I'm I'm kind of I've, I've committed to it now. Um, Last time I actually saw you in person was at Punked a yep. couple of years ago, and you had the release of a new album on ECM, a two CD album, and I took yeah, it home, right. and I put the first CD into the car CD player, and it's still there. Oh. And, and <laughs> I have stuck. never heard the set. No, it's not stuck. I just, every now and then, I will, you know, whether it's the radio on or I've got, yeah. you know, my phone plugged in or whatever, but I'll switch it to the CD and that's the CD that I'll play. And it's the only CD that has stayed there for the last two years. I've never heard the second CD <laughs> of it. But my, leading to me to my question yeah. is, is because I need to listen to the second CD because I know there's more next. What's next? 
You mean on that specific CD or no, no, no. <laughs> next work? No, I'll find that out for myself. Well, um, but what's what's the next thing coming out uh, with your name on the front of it? Well, um, I was uh, funny that Stefan, uh, at least Stefan w- Plank, w- Plank was here. Yeah. Um, I've been to Ingo Kraus, uh, who was an engineer working very closely with Connie Plank, uh, and recorded in his studio. And it was meant to be as an improv album, uh, but out of the material, some lines developed. So it's turned into this vocal album. <laughs> and so it's, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty inter- interesting just to follow, you know, the, um, to follow uh, the energy wherever that, that is. And for me, uh, trying out that kind of vocal thing is interesting. We're going to Tokyo in two weeks with Punkt doing the Ruchi Sakamoto uh, a choral piece mm-hmm. and doing a, a rework of that. We did Takemitsu uh, the year before and uh, a duo album on ECM with Avin Orset, oh, wow. a guitarist. Yeah. And uh, yeah, some small things here and here and there. Laraji, I'm, I'm doing some stuff with uh, Laraji, the mm-hmm. uh, sitter player. So, a little bit here. A few and works. There. And you're also a professor. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I teach it in, at the uh, University of, of Agder in Christensen, where I live with my family. And I, um, when they started the electronic music studies there, they invited me to, to teach. And I do love teaching, but it takes up so much amount of, of time. But I think it's important to pass on information. So if, if you know something then pass it on to 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 other generations so meaning at punk this year we had uh, 18 students performing oh. and that's not out of generosity it's because they are really really good yeah. so uh, it's it's important to do it we found that here at kth too that we're being hosted by this university institution yeah. and uh, we cherry picked amazing innovators and we got a whole lot from here just because of the, the caliber is so phenomenal, but but you said it's really important to pass on information. It's really important to pass on knowledge. What for the music tech vest crowd you have as your own kind of this is the knowledge that I have to share. What would you close with? I think that the trust thing, the generosity to uh, to follow the instinct and to to share your experiences uh, and to be, do it so in good spirit. Is probably what I would say. Fantastic. Jan Bang, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much for listening to the MTF podcast. If you're enjoying, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And in particular, if you could tell a couple of people about it, we'd really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your week and talk very soon. Cheers.